Well, good evening. We're excited and delighted that you are joining here with us this evening. And this is the Pennsylvania Avenue Baptist Church presents Conversations with Dr. Gigi. And we are so excited as we always are on Thursday evenings when we have just the privilege of bringing information and knowledge and wisdom from a great group of panelists. And we are not short on panelists tonight. You're going to love this particular program because it's going to be awesome. It's going to speak to your very needs. Needs, and we pray that it is a blessing to you. And now, without further ado, let me introduce the one that that we we love and we honor, and that we just really look forward to opening up with us and sharing. Um, none other than Dr. Jihan El Bayume, uh, our friend, our colleague, and and one a partner really with the Pennsylvania Avenue Baptist Church and all throughout the DMV, the leader of the Rodham Institute, and certainly one of uh, the great doctors that finds herself at the George Washington University uh, Hospital. So, Dr. Gigi, please oh my goodness, I guess. God, Dr. Reverend Curry, wow, what an introduction. Where are my parents behind you someplace? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, I, it has been my privilege and honor to be a partner to Pennsylvania Avenue Baptist Church because, really, under your uh, guidance and your leadership, you are a visionary that's really bringing a holistic solution to some of the overall disparities. And as of course we've been talking about the social determinants of health, access to healthcare is just a very small portion, all right? 20% of what is responsible for health outcomes. Education, food access, good food access, clean water, fresh air, the economic development of your community, um, and uh, poverty, eradicating poverty and racism, by the way, are really the key. So I am also excited tonight. Um, and before we talk about uh, the, the topic at hand, I'd like to just give a very quick uh, update about uh, COVID-19 here in the District of Columbia. You know, we've been pretty flat in terms of our numbers, but then they're beginning to kind of inch up. Nothing like some of the other states that you see, whether it's in California or God forbid, Florida or Texas. Right now, our death rate uh, of people who have lost their lives are 580 souls in Washington, D.C. thus far. Um, and 84% uh, of them are African Americans. So this is something that disproportionately impacts and claims the lives of Black people in the United States of America and specifically here in DC. So the things that are true are the things that we have always talked about, and that is really trying to be diligent with the masks and hand washing and physical distancing. I do have to tell you though, with it being so hot outside, the masks are a challenge. It really is, and I feel people. And you know, you see young people who want to do their thing, and you know, people are like, oh my God, we're going to the sixth month of this. But we know that that's the thing that's been proven to work. So if that's the thing that's been proven to work, we gotta, you gotta stick with this. Otherwise you'll see what's gonna happen as is happening in other states. So, um, and then there is one ray, very small ray of sunshine of a, a possible new vaccine. Um, you know, we have to be very careful because we know that vaccines um, may sound promising at the beginning and then may not be. So um, probably not gonna be available if so, maybe in the beginning of next year. But again, you know, um, this is no joke, COVID is not. And we're really living between two pandemics. And the second pandemic, and it's really related to our topic today, uh, which is the racism pandemic, um, really impacts everybody, but no one is more sensitive to the mental health stresses and strains than a pregnant woman. And I just wanna share with you, you know, in African um, beliefs and many other beliefs, but in Egypt, for example, you are never supposed to upset a pregnant woman ever, ever, ever. You are supposed to elevate her because that kind of, uh, you know, civilizations, all these civilizations recognize that the frame of mind of the mother not only impacts her, but impacts the unborn baby. So with that, we're going to be talking about um, postpartum depression, more than feeling blue, 
a conversation about postpartum depression. And I see our, our wonderful panelists are here today, um, Dr. Nicole Lang and Dr. Linda McGee. Um, welcome to the program. We are so delighted that you're with us. I'm gonna send it back to you, Dr. Reverend Curry. Thank you. Well, we, we, are, we are definitely excited uh, about this discussion and this particular topic. And, and I'm just going to ask, since we're talking about uh, postpartum depression and, and the like as it relates to um, women with pregnancy, I, I've heard and I was hoping that our panelists can substantiate that during this COVID season, um, there are increases in number of pregnancies as folk are, are staying uh, at home and have sheltered in place. So as as you introduce yourself, Dr. McGee and Dr. Lang, would you share with us what, what is postpartum depression? Um, are we seeing rises in numbers of pregnancies? And perhaps we can even compare the difference or contrast the difference, excuse me, between postpartum depression and postpartum psychosis. Who'd like to start? Dr. McGee, let's start with you. Um, okay, I'm Linda McGee, so you should know that I am a clinical psychologist, and I'll let Nicole handle the medical stuff, um, but postpartum depression is, is a subset of depression, and you get the feelings that you ordinarily get when you're depressed. You're sad, you cry more, you sleep lesser more, you eat more, or you eat less. Um, so some of the same symptoms that you have. And so your body is going through a lot of psychological, physical, and biological changes when you give birth. And some of the, the hormone levels are, are, you know, what was in your system at full blast begin to come out of your system fast. And sometimes those biological and physiological and psychological uh, convergence get out of whack. And so for most, uh, many women get some signs of postpartum depression. But when the, the symptoms continue and they go on for a while, then that's when you need to seek out help because normally they will balance themselves out given a, a week or two. So I'll let Dr. Nicole Lang pick up on the statistics of new babies coming into the world. Uh, I guess we're going to call them Corona babies. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> Nicole, you need to unmute. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you for having me back, Dr. Gigi and Reverend. I appreciate yeah. that. And uh, thank you. Welcome, Linda. I'm glad you're able to join us today. Uh, so my name is Dr. Lang and I'm a pediatrician. And yes, we have seen a baby boom happening now. And I anticipate another baby boom happening at the beginning of next year uh, from all of the um, sheltering in place <laughs> that's happening. <laughs> Um, and with regard to postpartum depression, uh, it is very common, probably about one in 10 women do experience some level of it. Um, and I like to distinguish that from baby blues, which happens within the first few days after giving birth or up to one to two weeks of feeling really overwhelmed and exhausted and sad. But uh, postpartum depression is more severe and more long lasting. And uh, again, echoing the symptoms that Linda just mentioned uh, of depression, but it does um, deal with um, affecting uh, the mother and fathers can also experience postpartum depression for that matter. Uh, but it is common and uh, the symptoms can be exacerbated by other things going on around us, uh, such as the pandemic and making um, uh, that uh, you know, more stressful for families. It's already stressful having a new baby and the challenges that come along with that. But in addition, when you're sheltering in place and having um, a lot of stress from uh, job security or housing or food insecurity, um, there's compounded uh, the effects that can have on uh, families. And, and so um, also another stressor uh, with the pandemic is that that we're less, um, uh, our extended family is less present uh, in the home. Uh, in the past, I would say, oh, please have the grandparents come, have you know, relatives come, neighbors come over to help you um, with a variety of things that it takes to have a new baby. 
And right now, everyone is staying their distance, again, for the safety of coronavirus. And so there is less help available. And so people are feeling more isolated and um, more frustrated and anxious in general. And um, I've had to stay open, again, to see the newborns because um, uh, many practices did close or shut down or lessen their volume, but the newborns keep coming. So we have to evaluate the newborns for a variety of reasons, uh, for weight gain, for jaundice and, and the like. And so um, when I'm seeing the new families, I do see an extra layer of stress that they are enduring uh, with the COVID um, pandemic. Yeah. It's a very unusual uh -huh. situation that we're in. I have a niece who was born in February or March, and I have I've only I've not seen her in person, and they live less than ten miles from me. So it's yeah. a, we find ourselves in very unusual circumstances. So yeah, I, I actually have a, a, a niece in in Texas, and as a result of COVID, there, uh, my sister. Um, has not been able to see the grandchild, right? Mm -hmm. And and so it's and and it's been very traumatic. I think she's mm -hmm. maybe seen her twice. Other than that, it's been through Zoom or FaceTime or or some other such medium. And and it makes me wonder. You know, we talk about postpartum with regard to the mother, but what is the impact on this whole family uh, as as it relates to? You know, usually there's a lot of joy and a lot of anticipation when a baby comes, but now folk can't go to hospitals necessarily, or mm -hmm. you can't participate in other things. How is that really impacting others that yeah. are grandparents, the, the uncles, the aunts, and or the other forms of caregivers, you might say? It impacts us as a community because yes. in, as African-Americans, we, we celebrate births we go, we converge around births. We celebrate life at the end of life. And all of these things have been impacted and they cause stress on us and more racial trauma. And, you know, so you, you, we are all experiencing this pandemic in this country, but some of us are experiencing it more than others. I had someone tell me the other day, she had been to four Zoom fun funerals in two weeks, mm. right? So, you know, whereas a lot of other Americans don't even know anyone that have been impacted. So this is part of the second pandemic, as Dr. Gigi just talked about, the racism and the, the results of that. And we're all experiencing increased amount of racial trauma due to COVID. And one, a part of that trauma, to bring it back to babies, is that we don't get to go hold our nieces and our grandnieces and our grandbabies and we, seeing them on Zoom is okay, but it's not a substitute. So it's this celebration and loss of closeness. It's, it's, a, it's a loss of our rituals and ceremonies and being able to like group together within our, our families and our, our play cousin families, as we call them, to sort of pitch in when there's a new baby. Yeah, yeah. I would just add to your point, uh, to all of what you're saying, everybody, is that this isolation has, it's a domino effect and a multi-generational mm -hmm. effect. So I'm a, an auntie too, and I have a new great nephew. He's now two months old. They're here in DC, but you know, I mean, it's, it's tough. So what that does to the social isolation, especially of people who are, you know, elderly who may not, because everybody's so worried, so worried that that makes a difference. But I would love to ask a question to both of you. Maybe Dr. Nicole Landway can start with you. How does this impact the social isolation, the baby's brain development? Because we know that interaction, that the number of words that a baby and a child hears in the first few months is, is really key in terms of their nervous system development. Can you speak to that, please? Yes, uh, that is one of my concerns as a pediatrician because uh, a child's um, brain development rapidly happens, especially in the first year of life, the first three years, but especially the first year. And so uh, babies are like, their brains are like sponges. So they absorb everything that's going on all around them. 
And that includes the interactions and the attachments and the uh, just love and care that goes into having a new baby around. And so with regard to their brain development, it is very necessary and important to read to your baby, talk to your baby, sing to your baby, play music. All of those things enhance the brain development and growth in addition to smiling faces and the joy that comes with having a baby. But if a mom is experiencing postpartum depression, just circling back to the topic, uh, there will be some uh, negative ramifications, if you will, if the baby is not seeing smiling faces. Um, actually, my mentor, Dr. Basilton, did research on this in particular, saying that uh, showing that a baby's brain development is much more um, connected when they're seeing smiling faces in front of them versus looking at a mom that is always frowning or always just with a, a blank stare. Uh, that does affect a baby's neurologic system. And mm. so um, I think it's very important if we are seeing a mother that's having these symptoms uh, or father for that matter, uh, and there's not a lot of social support around them that we really have to uh, intervene to get the mother and father some help. Uh, again, this is more common in mothers, but I don't wanna exclude fathers. Um, Cause it is a family unit. We're all a part of a, a bigger community. So, um, but the brain development is something that I am concerned about if, again, the stimuli is not there to help the baby's brain grow and develop. So um, so that is important to bring up. Right. And we, we know that if you're, there is a depressed mother who's untreated, the likelihood is, is that the child will be susceptible to their own mood disorders later in life. So this is not just about the baby. I think with this COVID and you guys all bought up the fathers, we're not going to know all of the ramifications for a while, for decades when they still, they're going to, there's going to be many studies about this because we're adding in a pandemic, financial stressors, people now, you know, I saw something about um, the eviction rate is starting to shoot up, right? I mean, serious concerns about home and hearth. And you have a two, you have an eight week old. So the amount of stresses on mother, father, close family members is enormous, it's unprecedented. And we've never seen anything like this. Um, at least, you know, most of us haven't seen anything like this. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's gonna, the, the psychological effects are gonna be far reaching and they're not gonna be entirely knowable right now, but as Dr. Lang and Dr. Gigi both brought up, we need to provide support to these mothers and fathers and these, these young children and help them figure out ways that they can get support, either from family or professionals. And if I could just add a, a study that was done looking at Latina women uh, who have been impacted <clears throat> during the ICE raids and having you know, mm -hmm. children being put in cages and all, that criminal behavior is that actually there were increases in miscarriages, mm -hmm. you know, just, I mean, just witnessing it, not being even a part of it. So I think for the African American community, all that PTSD, <laughs> post traumatic slave <laughs> disorder, right, mm -hmm. from having to witness this over and over again with really an increased level of helplessness because we are shut down. Mm -hmm. um, because we are in the pandemic. I'd love to hear sort of both of your thoughts on that and and maybe also some so, some right now solutions. Yeah. yeah. Um, one of the talks that I've been given as a psychologist is, is the, it's called the last six months, right? But it really is not just the last six months. It's really a 16, 19 problem. It's not necessarily just the last six months. But in the last six months, since uh, I do this timeline, it spans from January to the present. We've had a global pandemic. We've lost three times, black people have lost three times the number of people that, that of the blacks that died in Vietnam already. There are some days, when, the one day I checked, there was uh, about a month and a half ago, in the city of St. Louis, no white people had died of COVID, only black people. There were like zero white fatalities in the city of St. Louis. So not have we not have we gone through that. We have protests saying that people are not, you know, it was politicized. We've gone through 
this other pandemic where it has come to a head, where we had, you know, the death of George Floyd, Armand Arbery, um, the woman in St. Uh, Louisville, someone to give me her name, please. Uh, huh, excuse me, what is it? Taylor, Brianna Taylor. Brianna Taylor. Brianna Taylor, I'm sorry. I just did not want to say her name. Um, and, you know, so all of these things have happened at the same time. And it's, it's the perfect worst storm. You know, so we are in complete and total pressure in terms of racial trauma. And so, um, and, I'll, and I'll let Nicole Lane talk about some of the physi physiological impacts. But psychologically, we're more mistrustful. We don't believe in our government. We don't, we're, um, we're not sleeping. I had a woman the other day, a client tell me she hadn't slept since George Floyd, the day that George Floyd tape went out. I've had many people tell me that, um, that they are not sleeping at night. All of those things are racial trauma. And how do you combat it? Well, one thing you should do is you talk about it freely. You know, you talk or write or however many ways that you can get that gunk out, up and out of your system, right? You need to practice self-care the way you've never practiced it before. If you, whatever it is, if you get up and you read your Bible and you say your prayers and you meditate, um, you need to try to sleep. And that's one of the ones that I'm personally struggling with is to try to, you know, how do you sleep when you're not sleeping? Um, but you need to really put efforts into getting sleep. And finally, I'm going to say, um, you need to remember that you need to take care of yourself as opposed to people that are trying to be allied with you. you go with self first. And there's no, there's nothing wrong with trying to help people who are trying to ally themselves with you or trying to come over to the cause of Black Lives Matter. But first, you must take care of yourself uh, before you can take care of others. But being open to talking about it and expressing that the fact that we are hurt, we are a deeply hurt people right now. And I, the, the proudest thing in all of this mess is to hear Black people express that, that we're hurt, that we're upset, that we're frustrated, um, that we're deeply disappointed, right? And that we are at the end of our ropes. That, I mean, that, those are all healthy things to express. And we've been brought up to never let them see you sweat. Don't talk about those kinds of things. What in actuality, mentally is a good thing. So I want uh, to, to, uh, Nicole to pick up on that and, and uh, talk a little bit about what she's seeing physiologically uh, in her office. Right. No, thank you, Linda. I think that's all very important to make sure um, feelings are validated, number one. Uh, number two, encouraging, like you said, expression of your feelings. And three, getting help from psychologists like yourself or psychiatrists or social workers or guidance counselors, um, faith-based community leaders like yourself, Reverend, many, where you have to look for avenues of support and figure out how we, if we can't see folks face-to-face, -face, um, you know, come to, you know, well, one, I can see them face-to-face -face in my office, uh, again, very uh, protected in PPE, but um, if you can't come in and see someone face-to-face, -face, again, doing the Zoom uh, connections or talking with someone over the phone or um, having some type of way, we have this technology now uh, to stay connected, and I think that's important. I just wanted to back up a second because one other thing that we do in our office, um, and what many pediatric offices are now doing is screening for postpartum depression using a tool called the Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Scale. And so it's a list of, uh, you know, several questions, probably about 10 questions, and it's scored. And if you score positive with a certain number, then uh, that tells me as a pediatrician that the mom is going through postpartum depression. And so from there, I will, again, refer out to resources. There are several in the community that we can refer families to, but it's so important because uh, treatment is necessary for this. Uh, it's not something that will all of a sudden go away on its own without getting the help you need by talking through it. Sometimes medication for depression is necessary too, 
but also um, it's important not to be ashamed or feel embarrassed about feeling like this because many uh, new moms think, oh, I'm not supposed to feel this way. I have a new baby. I'm supposed to be joyful, but it is overwhelming. It is, you know, anxiety driven. And with the pandemic and the uh, racism and COVID pandemics going on, it's escalating everyone's stress level. And um, I just want to also mention that um, being in uh, isolation or sheltering in place, um, what some families are experiencing now is more uh, domestic violence and child abuse. And um, two days ago, I, I uh, was um, asked to do a webinar on that particular topic during this season of COVID and how um, what we're seeing now is that there's an increase in calls to domestic violence uh, centers, uh, but oddly enough, there's a decrease in reports of child abuse because children are now home. They're away from the teachers that are the really the eyes that are watching over them on a daily basis. And they're one of the biggest reporters of child abuse to Child Protection Center. So what we're seeing is less reports of child protection uh, to the centers, but we're seeing in the emergency room more severe cases of child abuse with abusive head traumas and things of that nature. So we're seeing uh, child abuse get to the point that it's so serious that they're worried about the child dying, so they're taking them to the ER at the last minute. Um, but the reports are lessening from the child abuse perspective, but from the domestic violence perspective, um, there are more calls to those centers that the mothers are able to make uh, to ask for help. Um, and so with the, um, some centers are, um, uh, because there's not a lot of funding and support, all of the funding that went out for, uh, from the government, there wasn't a focus on domestic violence. Um, and so many mothers that are experiencing depression and compounded by domestic violence, there's really a risk for the child uh, and the family as a whole. So I think that has to be addressed and let families know that there are resources out there um, to call. There are many hotlines uh, and the such to reach out to. And also I always refer people to their faith-based resources too, um, because that's a very important um, safety net for families. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm glad mm -hmm. you raised that because um, what's very important, it, it seems to me, not only are domestic violence cases going up, but when you layer domestic violence with living in the food desert, with the all of the mm -hmm. other traumas, and they're not just layered nice and neat on top of one another, they're sort of interwoven. How do you help the family, beginning with the mother, when she thinks she's a bad mother, and then she's in a domestic violence situation, and now she doesn't want to tell because she just feels bad. How? How? What do we do with regard to that? And how can we be of help and service to uh, those those young ladies out there who may be suffering in that way? If I could answer that, because actually I don't know if you know this. Dr. Reverend Curry, but domestic violence is one of my areas of interest that I've lectured on. So when you talk to anybody, and it's the majority are women who actually, uh, men also uh, have domestic violence or victims, but, but women, and of course, one of the subgroups that is at highest risk are actually pregnant women. So um, we tend, to, as, as, a, as, as the public, we tend to think of domestic violence as the, the physical piece. But the reality is, is that the emotional and psychological torture and torment is actually the foundation mm -hmm. of violence. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're such a horrible mother. Anybody that has you as a mother would, you know, a poor child, you know, nobody else would want you. These kinds of tormenting kinds of statements. Mm -hmm. The physical abuse is, if you will, the punctuation marks. And that cycle of the physical peace really is different depending on the relationship. But, we, and I'll say mostly women who are in that situation will say that they're walking on eggshells before the physical explosion. Now the physical explosion may be hitting, but it also may be abusing the child because that is a piece of it. Child, where there is child abuse, there's woman abuse and vice versa. These right. are linked. The other aspect of this is that um, this, the cycle of violence can actually increase. 
Um, and some of the things that tips that I would give people is never fight in the kitchen or in the bathroom. Those are the most two most dangerous places in the house mm. because in the in the bathroom you can slip and fall on that marble. You hit your head on the sink. In the kitchen, there are obviously weapons. Try to get rid of any weapons that are in, in the house, whether that's guns or knives or any baseball bats, whatever that is, to minimize harm. And then, uh, you know, women who've been in these situations really talk about trying to avoid fighting or arguing when somebody's inebriated either with alcohol or drugs, because that's actually the most dangerous time. And if you notice that somebody, like I had one patient whose husband stopped beating her, but what he started doing was sleeping with a pillow, uh, with a gun underneath his pillow. Lord, so the level of escalate, is, that's actually extremely, extremely dangerous. And finally, I tell people, if somebody's threatening to kill themselves, that's a very dangerous time because it's, we've heard about murder, suicide. Somebody's mm -hmm. going to kill it. That's a very dangerous time. But it's also equally dangerous. And this is important for family members who may be aware of this and say, oh, you need to leave them to you. Well, 75% of women who are killed in the context of domestic violence are killed when they're trying to leave. She has the sense of knowing what the situation is mm -hmm. better than anybody else. The most important thing that any of us can do for somebody who's going through domestic violence is to validate who they are. And mm -hmm. when you look at um, people who have been in these situations and were able to get out in whatever ways that they were able to get out. And I'm not putting value on those people more than the ones that stay because people stay for a variety of very complex reasons and they may not have a choice but to stay. Is they say just a kind word from somebody. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna close by giving you an example. And this comes from New York. This uh, very rich couple, rich white couple was uh, where the husband was beating on his wife were in New York City and for a, like a, a, a vacation. And they were at a stoplight and the wife said, oh, wow, look at that building. It's such and such an architecture. And he just laid into, oh, you're so stupid. You're so this. So they're at the light. This New York City lady oh, at the light says, you're an idiot. She's right. And kept on walking. That validation to that woman of, yes. I am right. This is a stranger. Just kept, just kept walking, you know, but it is validation. And we don't know, how, you know, who, maybe somebody at the grocery store, maybe somebody in passing that doesn't know the person. You don't deserve this. Just that one statement. You do not deserve to be treated like this is important. Wow. Wow. Mm. Dr. McGee? Um, a couple of thoughts. Um, you you ask, how do we work with it? Yeah. I, I start with safety, like Dr. Gigi just said. You know, um, I've had more calls in the last six months where the person is in their car taking the session or they are on their balcony or they are whispering. Um, because this the stress and trauma on families and in in the people that are pregnant, it's, it's real. Um, so there, so I try to help them, as, as Dr. Gigi says, not the when, but the, the how, okay? Uh, and you just take it methodically step at a time. Have a safety kit, have some things in the car, have some things hidden, some money, something, anything that you could squirrel away to help you, um, you know, enlist support. Um, in addition to that, um, just working on the self-esteem and building the person up uh, because you start, you don't, no one starts off accepting abuse and uh, feeling like they're worthless. Usually it builds, right? So just to sort of validate, as Dr. Gigi said, who they are, that they are worthy of better, that their children are worthy of better. Um, and to help them methodically work through it. I'm, I'm, I'm with women. I firmly believe in choice. Uh, but if there's a safety situation, a lot of times I will, you know, give more advice than I typically would. But um, to reach out to faith, faith, uh, their faith, their uh, their churches, 
wherever the support systems might be. But right now is African-Americans and, and other people of color, we need to try to see what we can help. Um, and that, that doesn't always mean a professional. As Dr. Gigi said, that could just be checking on someone or somebody you know that the husband's under stress, he's lost his job. I mean, it was already abusive before we hit COVID. So you, you need to check on people. And one last thing I wanna say is that um, I wanna speak out on behalf of the doctors and the clinicians and the pastors. The caregivers are under severe stress. I will say personally, this is the most stress that I've ever undergone as a clinician. And I've been very honest with speaking out about that so that somebody that's maybe on this Facebook um, tonight can hear that they need a break, care for the caregivers and urge them to please take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. I, I've had a lot of clinicians reach out to me. I can't do anymore. And I might like, take a day off, you know, cancel all your appointments to go for a walk every day. The same things I'm methodically trying to do for myself. I'm urging all of you that are on this panel and everybody that's out there listening to us to do. Yes. No, I definitely agree. Thank you for saying that, Linda. And that's exactly what I'm trying to practice what I preach too. So there are some days that I say, no, I'm not seeing patients this day. I'm going to do just some self-care. And that's what I try to recommend to my mothers too in the practice to make sure they are taking some time for themselves. It is so important. Um, and it can be, uh, again, just a check-in with the friend it can be a meditation, it can be a deep breathing exercise, it can be listening to soft music, journaling your thoughts. Uh, again, making sure you're also eating healthy food. Again, the food that you eat make a difference on your mood. Getting sleep when you can. I know that was mentioned at the beginning when, especially for uh, new moms uh, that are sleep deprived, but um, for everybody, sleep is important, food is important and exercise. Uh, again, just trying to have smart, healthy habits and implementing that in our own lives as clinicians, but also um, encouraging those that we speak to to make sure they're doing um, those things for themselves too. And reaching out for help when you think you've reached at the end of your rope, not giving up, but knowing that someone is there that cares for you and that there is help out there, even for domestic violence victims, for child abuse victims, for postpartum depression, um, for a wide variety of, of things. And actually the Rodham Institute has uh, really partnered with many groups in the community to help during this pandemic with uh, meals you've provided and resources and just having a whole wide variety of, of things for folks in need. And so I think that really is uh, an example of what, you know, if you want that quote, you know, uh, those, uh, uh, to whom much is given, much is expected, to help those around you, uh, you know, when you do have something extra to give, to just go ahead and give it, because that may make all the difference in the world to a family that's struggling with all the stress around them. Yeah, there's a question that has come in, and I thank you for your comments from uh, Facebook, and it says, due to possible anxiety, should expected moms be discouraged from watching the news regarding COVID-19 number of cases? So should they uh, refrain from watching the bad stuff, so to speak? Yes. Uh, <laughs> simple <No>. answer. Straight <laughs> to the point. Um, I yeah. love it. Yeah. I mean, COVID, the racism, the shootings by the police, the... Portland situation in Portland, the, some of our leaders who, sham, who shall not be named, um, you know, all of it, you know, they're, they're, it just is very, very stressful. And if it's causing you stress to watch the news each and every day, I, I, I've had to tell people you, it's either medication or turn the news off. Right. Um, social media is another, another source of stress yeah. because, you know, there's all these postings about Brutality after brutality after brutality. Uh, and not enough gospel songs, right? And, and things that make you feel happy. So, and we're crunched because we can't go out and distract ourselves, sure. right? We, we can't go to our favorite restaurant indoors. We can't go to the movies, you know? Uh, so, you know, you have to try harder to distract yourself. But in the, a simple answer is if, 
you could watch or give yourself a time limit or um, take what I call a vacation, a TV news vacation, that is often helpful. Yes, I I'm want to add that uh, the social media part, some of our, we had a session with some young people uh, a few weeks now ago. Social media is really just, uh, can be vile and toxic. Mm -hmm. And actually the kids, young people that were on the, on the webinar were saying how they even noticed, you know, difficulty with sleeping, aggression, more paranoia when they're engaged in these things. So I think that's a good advice for all of us, but particularly I would say sensitive groups. Yeah, Dr. Yes. Lang. I definitely agree. You have to monitor how much of the news you take in because the, mood, the news is primarily negative information, yeah. right? And so if you constantly give yourself negative energy that's you're it. going to bring yourself down. You have to monitor that and really put up like a boundary uh, of what you're going to feed yourself, like physically and spiritually, right? And emotionally. So what are you feeding your soul? And is that going to be just the constant trauma over, you know, what, uh, you know, the person that lives on Pennsylvania Avenue um, is saying? <laughs> Or are you going to like <laughs> listen to uh, you know the services from church uh, on you know about uh, how you know you are supported, you are lifted up. We you you know prayer works. Like let the more people pray together, positive things will come. Right. So again, realizing that God hasn't brought us this far to leave us now. Like <laughs> we're going to get through this one day at a time. It's not going to be yeah. easy, but we will get through it together. And I think we have to, again, recognize when too much negative uh, energy is around to figure out how to counterbalance that and how to surround yourself with um, positive energy and with gratitude. There is this one word in this, this phrase in this song, it says suffering and gratitude cannot coexist. So let's focus and shift our energy on what we're thankful for and what, it, what are the blessings that are going on around us in spite of all the suffering. And then just try to move forward and try to come up you know, with a plan of moving forward. Well, I, I'm so grateful for that because um, everything on Pennsylvania Avenue is not necessarily bad. We're on, the, go. Um, oh, no, the, we're on the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue, there you go. The southeast end, and, yes. and that, that everything is not necessarily bad. But you know, one of the things we did, the question did speak to watching the news. But if I heard Dr. McGee earlier um, about folk not sleeping, and if I've listened to all of you, um, how, how is it bad to binge on Netflix and Hulu and all, all of that sort of thing? Um, how do folk find these outlets? You know, I'm one, you know, I pray, I do centering prayer, which I, and we have Monday meditations where I do all sorts of different ways of meditating. What else is there that we can do to help mothers and literally help the family sort of decompress from all of this stress? It depends, you know, um, find, you know, find the thing. I, I'm trying to pick up a couple of new skills. Okay. I used to, I used to bake, but my husband is saying no more baking. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, baking, I, I, because, because, why? because it's so good. Why? Yeah, because it's so delicious. Yeah, uh -huh. I'm a baker. Nicole knows that. I bake cakes, and I bake cakes for an organization. Okay, let's let's stop. Do the I see visions of ice cream. Oh let's yeah. Stop. Let's um, stop. but just you know, like, and I'm also trying to rediscover my love of reading. So sure. I'm not the person is necessarily going to be binging on Netflix. Um, okay. But there is nothing wrong with it as long as you're not like doing it for three days straight and not feeding your children or, you know, something like that. That's, but that's it's good. nothing wrong with Netflix, watching TV, finding books that you like. But I mean, I am uh, big on centering, right? Mm -hmm. In the prayer, the meditation, yep. the yoga, yep. the things that calm the spirit, mm -hmm. you know, the tea, whatever it is. You know, I tried the calm tea the other day and it actually was calming. Uh, so whatever things that bring the stress level down that are legal. Uh, yeah, <laughs> say that one more time. Not a, that are legal and not addictive. Um, yeah. That 
you know, give it a try. Like what is mine may not be yours. You know, I don't like yoga, but I like Pilates, you know, whatever thing that works, but it should be calming. It should bring you down. Not, you know, I have a friend that's trying knitting, you know, just something because we have this extra time. And I realized how much time I spent commuting because now I have a lot of more time to get things done and also a lot more leisure time. And so people need to like take that opportunity to like take that walk with your kid, you know, play tennis. That's what I've, one of the things I've been doing to distant therapy because sometimes therapy doesn't work on very small kids in the, on the Zoom, <laughs> not as well. Uh, so I've been going out and scheduling a couple of tennis matches with clients every week as a way to mm. sort of get myself out mm. and get them out. But try to find something that works for you and your kids, right? You know, so you could sort of kill a few birds with one stone. Well, I, can I, I just totally can I just add something to the sleep? Mm. Because I think all of us, but particularly you, Dr. McGee, have put that as something extremely important which it is because if you don't sleep, there is a domino effect which impacts mm -hmm. your mood. It really mm -hmm. has a, a, a really negative impact on your overall, both physical and mental health. So, you know, I noticed here in the United States that people really do not know the importance of sleep and how to get ready for sleep. So when I used to go the summer oh, to my grandmother or my grandparents in Egypt, do you know when we used to take naps it used to have to be completely quiet. You could not have a lot of noise. It had to be dark, okay? So in the afternoon and certainly at night because the belief system there is that you could actually, the soul kind of comes a little bit out of the body during sleep. And if you do that, that can actually disturb the soul. But, you know, dark and quiet are very important. And then you know, the, the hour or so before you go to sleep has to be an hour of preparation. So just like we do for kids, I'm going to let Dr. Lang speak to this, you know, the, the, the preparation, the ritual, all the things that we do for children, we should do for ourselves. And then when it comes to these things, and I'm, I'm guilty, just like everybody else, of being on this for, you know, prior to, uh, to going to sleep. Well, for every one hour that you're on this device, you actually disrupt your sleep. It delays your falling asleep by 15 minutes. Wow. Just to give you an idea. Say that. Say that. For every hour that you're on this, it delays sleep by 15 minutes. Every hour on the phone, delays. Yes. So <laughs> if you could, if you could actually just reduce the, I know, if you dim the, the, the phone, I know, right? If you could dim this, the phone, there's also something called the Calm app. Where yep. it will play, you know, you know, rainfall. They can do mm -hmm. stories, but um, I think that sleep is just so important. But I mean, you know, what do you tell your patients about putting their kids to sleep and routine, Doctor Lang? Yes, no, I tell them it's very important um, to have like a routine or a ritual in place, especially for toddlers. So I'm gonna put aside newborns for just a second because that's a different sleep schedule. Um, but for toddlers and older children, it is important to uh, have one structure. I think they do like the routine of, okay, this is the bedtime and this is what I have to do before bedtime. So bath time, brush your teeth, story time, you know. Um, so getting everything, like they have little loveys sometimes that they have to sleep with. So having the lights out, sometimes they have a little night light on. So depending on if they have nightmares or night terrors. So there's different things to think about, but it is important to have, uh, you know, the same thing happening every night that helps them to get in the routine. It helps their brain to anticipate what's happening next. And it is helpful uh, the longer the sleep, the better. Okay. And because sometimes some children are, are up way too late and, and it can impact, you know, one, their immune system because your immune system revs up when you're sleeping. So, um, and also just your memory and your concentration ability. So if you don't have a lot of sleep. So I think it's really, really important to um, institute um, 
bedtime routines and bedtime rituals. Uh, and sometimes it'll go off kilter, that's okay. No one's perfect, but to just have a general semblance of, okay, let's get ready for bed. Let's do X, Y, and Z to do that. Now for newborns, newborns days and nights are confused. They are up more at night and sleep more during the day. So in the newborn period, that's why postpartum depression is so important to discuss. It's because your sleep deprivation, as you mentioned, when that is off balance, and you're feeling overwhelmed in general, that will impact your ability to do the day-to-day -day task for your baby and for yourself for that matter. So it is important, I tell new moms, to sleep when the baby sleeps during the day when they have those naps and to not think that when the baby's sleeping during the day, that's your time to cook, clean, grocery shop, and do whatever around the house because guess what? At night, your baby's gonna be up more and need to eat more throughout the evening and night hours. So it's important to try to rest when you uh, can, but also to ask for help um, again, from whoever is in the house physically, or if neighbors or extended family can bring things to you, again, to keep things safe in the pandemic, you know, to drop things off or send things, or, you know, we have Amazon now <laughs> for some families that do that. But, um, but I think it's important to, uh, to think about, um, you know, what you need with regard to sleep and to try to implement that consistently. Yeah, I, uh, Dr. McGee mentioned two in the chat, two great, great uh, apps. And one is Calm and the other is Insight Timer. Um, these are for meditation. I personally use Insight Timer. And, and I'm glad you all are sharing this because it very much ties into um, the whole um, spiritual space as it relates to um, what the uh, priests, we call them desert fathers and mothers of previous centuries, call paying attention to the hours. And so there's a rhythm of the hours that we should be mindful of in terms of even rising and in terms of going, going to bed at night. So, and, and they built a whole understanding of the hours of the day around their prayer lives and all of these things are so well integrated. And perhaps it would behoove us even during seasons like this in isolation to have some sort of rhythm like you're speaking of that includes mindful meditation, the readings and all of the other things that, that you shared. And one of the things I, I'm just hopeful that you can share with us is in the absence of all of that, knowing that we also have some mental health challenges, when we don't know what to do, where do we go from help? Can you tell us about your personal practices and where we can find out more about what you do and where we can go from help, from mental health um, for these mothers and these fathers and families on the uh, psychological side and on um, from pediatric associates. What can we do? How can you all help us? I want you to share a little bit about that. Right. So, well, I'll start. So personally, what I do when I need um, some ba more balance in my life, I will uh, go to prayer. I will go to meditation. I do also have the Calm app on my phone. 10% Happier is another app uh, that has good meditations. Um, I also have something called Rain Rain that has ocean wave sounds that helps me sleep at night. I put that on all the time now. Um, and uh, again, I try to, uh, in my life, eat healthy and exercise and um, uh, again, try to get as much sleep as possible. So um, the other very important thing is that I have a real good core group of friends that I reach out to, uh, to stay connected. Uh, some are on the West Coast. And so I do call them sometimes at midnight. It's only nine o'clock there. So <laughs> we do uh, talk uh, late at my time. But, um, but I think it's important to know that uh, there's a core group of people that I know I can depend on that are in DC in my home, my husband, my daughter, but also um, people that I have over the years uh, connected with and that maintains and helps to keep my balance. Um, and so what I tell families is that they should stay connected to their friends and their relatives. Uh, but if I notice something in my patients, um, I will refer them. And oftentimes Linda knows this. I refer many patients to her 
um, that need extra help from a psychological perspective if they are feeling stressed and overwhelmed and they have run out of the resources and uh, the different strategies. And so sometimes you need extra help from professionals to give you the strategies and coping skills that will help you get through uh, the, uh, the storm, so to speak. So um, again, I try to practice what I preach and I try to encourage my families. And if I'm really worried, I will reach out to them uh, even after the visit on a different day, just to check in and to make sure they are doing okay and to see if they did follow up with recommendations and to ask them what they really need and to just be there to listen. Sometimes they just need folks to listen to them. If you would, so, you, what's if you your would, practice, quickly, Nicole? Dr. McGee, <laughs> if you would, doc, uh, uh, Dr. Lang, just share in the chat where folk can find you. What, what's your contact information? Because okay. they, they, they may want to follow up and, and we'd like to have that. Please, Dr. McGee. Um, my practice is um, um, on the website is Dr. McGee and Associates uh, com. My speaker website is Linda, Linda McGee .com. Uh, And you can reach me via either one of those. And my practice is in Chevy Chase um, in Friendship Heights, right outside of the District of Columbia. And I specialize in adolescents um, and uh, young adults. And, and thank you, Dr. Gigi, for the dimension of un unbirthed. And I'll, I'll just say that Pennsylvania Avenue Baptist is, is we're working on a, a pilot project where we do a virtual health ministry. We call all of the uh, folk in the congregation as well as some of those folk in the community. And we do a social determinants of health-based screen. And we can, one Aunt Bertha, is one of the uh, places that we can uh, send folk to deal with mental health and, and other resources. And I do always, always, you wanna make sure that we can go to the Rodham Institute website and um, certainly Washington Pediatric Associates. And we just have a whole host of resources. That's the point of these webinars, to provide you with resources, have discussion that gets you thinking and drives you to the places where you can get help. And I would just like to have uh, any closing words from Dr. Gigi, because our time is always almost up, and then from our panelists, and we will sign off from there. Well, thank you as always for just a robust discussion and for really sharing your hearts with us and your wisdom. I think that's the most important thing. Um, I'm just going to share my personal favorite form when I'm stressed out. Um, I like the nature shows. I find that those, especially the ones that are in the water, are kind of calming. Um, and I, if, if I can't, you know, really have a hard time, uh, there are baby uh, things on YouTube where the babies are doing all kinds of cute things or the, the pet ones. Uh, but it is to have an idea of where I'm at to try to compensate. Like, this is not the time to listen to the news if I'm in that frame of mind. And that to remind everybody we are all interconnected none of you whoever's listening and the people on the panel are alone you can just if if you need something just send an email to the rodham institute um or any of us of course many of you know dr reverend curry just and we will we may not be the people to give you the help but we can get you the help so thank you all right um i'm, I'm just gonna say take care of yourselves out there and reach out to your friends and relatives um, and um, insurance is now paying co-pays. That's the final thing I want to say. Still covering co-pays for mental health. So if you have insurance, please reach out. They're waiving the co-pays right now. <laughs> okay. I just wanted to thank you again, Reverend and uh, Dr. Gigi. We really yes. appreciate you even providing this forum to have these discussions to reach a larger community that we don't see day to day. Mm -hmm. But I think it's so important to know that um, for especially new moms, I know the topic today is postpartum depression, but we talk about a wide variety of things, but for mm -hmm. new families with new babies, uh, with a lot of extra um, pressure, just know that we are available. There's people in the community available for you. Um, you're not in this alone. Uh, we're in this together. As Gigi said, we are all interconnected. What happens to one happens to all of us. And I think the more we support each other, you know, physically, mentally, spiritually, the better we will be. 
Well, thank you so very much to each and every one of you, Dr. McGee, and certainly Dr. Lang, thank you for coming again. This has just been a wonderful uh, discussion. I've learned a lot from you all and the breadth of knowledge that you have, and perhaps sometime in the future, we will be able to have you just back again, just to talk about some of these, these issues, because this is necessary. This is actually therapeutic, and we, we are so grateful. Thank you for sharing with us, and as always, Dr. Gigi, we just are so grateful for you and the conversations that we get the chance to have and a big Wakanda hug to everybody. And, and we are just so grateful for having uh, this time together. So we'll, we'll sign off with saying, just remember that God is smiling on you and that there's hope when you put your trust in him. God bless you and have the best evening in the world. Thank you and goodbye.